Picture a 1950s housewife. You can organise yourself so that you can do your housework first and still go out and still be home in time for the children when they come home. Cut now to the late 1980s. Replace the corset with shoulder pads, place a briefcase in one arm and a happy baby in the other. This new vision of the empowered, successful super mum who juggles everything has been with us in different forms since. Influenced by 90s girl power. Our philosophies, girls con controlling our destiny, taking control of our lives. To the girl boss mantras of today. Girl boss, girl boss, hashtag girl boss. These images really matter. They tell us what success is supposed to look like. They tell us that if we put in the work, if we reach out and grab success, we can thrive. It's a tantalising promise, but is it the reality? Welcome to LSE IQ, the podcast where we ask social scientists and other experts to answer one intelligent question. I'm Natalie from the IQ team, where we work with academics to bring you their latest research and ideas. In this episode, I ask, can mothers do it all? I speak to LSE's Dr. Shani Orgad about media portrayals of mothers and what effects these have on all of us. We find out the real reasons mums leave the workforce, deep dive into the media coverage of one of the world's most talked about mothers and get Shani's advice on how to do it all. I think there's a really deep irony to the fact that actions women are taking, and I see this all the time, with the objective of staying in the workforce actually lead to their eventually leaving. That's Cheryl Sandberg, business exec, billionaire, and author of Lean In, Women, Work, and the Will to Lead in her renowned 2010 TED Talk. Here's what happens. We're all busy, everyone's busy, a woman's busy. And she starts thinking about having a child. And from the moment she starts thinking about having a child, she starts thinking about making room for that child. How am I going to fit this into everything else I'm doing? And literally from that moment, she doesn't raise her hand anymore. She doesn't look for a promotion. She doesn't take on the new project. She doesn't say, me, I want to do that. She starts leaning back. Women, she argued, are unconsciously holding themselves back from professional advancement. To counter this, we have to lean in and reach out for success. I'm a millennial and I'm currently child free, but I'm thinking about my future. I find this message quite appealing. If I put in the work now, maybe I can thrive in all aspects of my life. These are precisely the messages that the women I interviewed were surrounded by, to lean in, to feel positive about yourself. That's Dr. Shani Orgad, we spoke in a North London park late last year. When researching for her book, Heading Home, Motherhood, Work and the Failed Promise of Equality, Shani interviewed a number of middle and upper middle class women who had left successful professional careers after having children. I spoke to women who left the workforce seemingly as a choice. And in many ways it was a choice and they were the first one to admit that they made a choice and that they had the privilege to make a choice that many women don't. And at the same time, while it is framed as a choice, what I heard time and again and what I learned is that it was, as one of the women I interviewed told me, a forced choice. And it was a choice that was forced by toxic war cultures, by war cultures that are utterly incompatible with family life, and I'd say with life generally, I think even with before having family. So we're talking about demanding working hours, we're talking about, um, you know, pay gaps, we're talking about sexism in the workplace, um, we're talking about the demand to be present, this idea of presentism in the office, um, demands for relocation at kind of, you know, a short notice and so on. And these toxic war cultures weren't just their own, they were often also their partners. I only interviewed, I should say, heterosexual women, most of whom were married. Some of them were divorced by the point I interviewed them. And so also their husbands' workplaces were toxic. And so these women were, to put it very bluntly, pushed out of the workforce. And yet the media construction and the cultural wider construction was that they opted out. So while Cheryl Sandberg claimed that the problem lies with women opting to lean back, Shani believes that it's really toxic work cultures which force women, 
not only to lean back, but to leave the workforce altogether. The other thing is how impactful, but also how insidious and terribly painful the impact and the influence of cultural representations and media representations can be. And so these women I've interviewed were deeply disillusioned by their attempts to combine motherhood and working lives, yeah, high-powered careers. And they experienced deep inequality also at home, because at home they'd come and start what Arlie Hochschild called the second shift. In her 1989 book, Ali Hochschild describes the second shift as the unpaid labour done at home, like housework and childcare, after a workday at a paid job. While both men and women experience the second shift, women still tend to take on most of this responsibility. At the same time, they were surrounded by these images of women who kick ass, yeah, and lean in. And so this kind of real deep discrepancy between what my colleague Rosalind and Gil and I call the confidence culture, whereby there's this imperative through self-help advice, through popular television, through advertisement, through apps, circulating in our culture to adopt the Wonder Woman pose and uh, feel assertive, to love yourself, you know, you love your body, to be confident and feel in your own skin and so on and so forth. So these all these kind of self-confidence imperatives where the kind of premise is that the problem lies in women as individuals. If we only as women fix ourselves, if we only work out with this app on how to hold our body and how to feel confident, we will crack it. Here's the key to, you know, solving inequality. Even though they recognised the huge structural problems in their workplaces, the women Shani spoke to were surrounded by images of empowered women, think briefcase in one arm and baby in the other, and messages about self-confidence and success. How did these women navigate this paradox? A very typical interview would go an hour and a half, two hours with a, a professional woman who was a lawyer or accountant or a teacher or a social worker, and she'd tell me all these kind of systematic, structural um, aspects of inequality that she's experienced at work, the ways in which inequality at home has also impacted her decision to leave paid employment. And then she would end and said to me, you know, but the problem was really that I lacked the confidence. I didn't have the ambition. And I would stop, like, you know, my jaw dropped every time and said, how can you tell me that you lack the ambition? I spoke to a woman who, was, who studied medicine for seven years and then did specialism. I said, you learned for all these years. You wanted to become a geneticist. How can you tell me that you lacked the ambition? And she looked at me and she kind of giggled, embarrassed. And she said, yeah, I suppose you're right. It's contradictory, isn't it? But yeah, yeah, I didn't have the ambition. These are women who are privileged women. Most of them are middle class, some of them are upper middle class. They're highly educated, they have the resources, and yet they blame themselves. So other women, I think, would find it harder still. I think it's so crucial to understand how subtle but profoundly impactful cultural messages can be. And I go to the very problematic Lean In Manifesto by Sheryl Sandberg, where she calls women to internalize the revolution. And I found that rather than internalizing the revolution, they internalize the blame. While I wasn't entirely surprised to hear that these women found the modern work world and home life incompatible, I was shocked to hear that they ended up blaming themselves for their perceived failures, for their inability to lean in. As Michelle Obama reportedly put it in 2018, it's not always enough to lean in, because that shit doesn't work all the time. Representations matter. While we've heard how damaging images of the self-empowered woman can be, it's not all bad news. In recent years, public visibility of motherhood has been increasing rapidly. I asked Shani what this means. We see more attention being given to motherhood, mothering, mothers. So um, there's more coverage that relates to issues relating to mothers. Um, politicians, celebrities identify much more actively as 
mothers or in relation to motherhood. And generally speaking, I think also within popular culture, we see much more uh, attention and dramas that are really centering the issue of motherhood and mothering. The most kind of important and interesting aspect of this hyper-visibility of motherhood is also the diversification um, of representations of mothers. We know that historically mothers were represented in much narrower ways um, and it's not to say that it's uh, perfectly diverse but we do see more and more different versions of motherhood that really question older and more conservative notions of what, what does it mean to mother at all. And why do you think there's been this intensification over the last few years? So one is the increased levels of education and greater participation of women in the workforce. Of course, the influence and ongoing influence of feminism, and more recently the kind of rise of what's been called popular feminism. The whole crisis around reproductive rights that is very much kind of on the political agenda in various places around the world has of course been very closely attached to visibility of mothering and also the kind of ongoing questioning of biological view of motherhood with um, LGBTQ activism and um, related kind of social movements that really ask us to or demand that motherhood is understood in a much more expansive and complex ways. It sounds like the definition of motherhood is constantly shifting. Yeah, exactly. It's a shifting terrain. I think that's absolutely right. Definitions of motherhood are morphing. On this landscape of shifting terrain, Shani and her co-researcher, Kate Baldwin, have been examining the coverage of one of the decade's most talked about mothers. She sits in a very unique position. Identifying as feminist and as a woman of colour, she has also made her way into one of the world's most white, conservative and traditionalist institutions. If we take all of the media coverage seriously for a moment, what can Meghan Markle tell us about what we as a society think about motherhood right now? Meghan Markle. The Duchess of Sussex. Meghan Markle. Meghan, Duchess of Sussex. Duchess Meghan and Prince Harry have just announced that they are expecting their first child. Let's take a look at the timeline of events. The moment it was back in, on 6th of May 2019. Mother and baby are doing incredibly well. Um, it's been the most amazing experience I could ever um, possibly imagine. Um, how any woman does what they do is beyond comprehension, but we're both absolutely thrilled. That's a break from all previous kind of royal announcements of birth. This really reflected the couple's kind of very millennial, progressive, egalitarian mindset. And it's a moment of recognition and appreciation in public discourse of women's labor. More specifically, it's significant in the context of black motherhood. So given the invisibility of black motherhood and specifically the invisibility of black motherhood and black maternal mortality. According to reports published by Embrace UK in 2021, black women in the UK are four times more likely to die from complications in pregnancy and childbirth than white women. Harry's statement was a refreshing recognition of black maternal labor. But what was hidden in this moment? the royal couple insisted on not sharing where she's given birth. There were, again, lots of rumours and guesses. Archie Harrison Mountbatten-Windsor, his birth certificate has been released and it confirms that the Duchess of Sussex gave birth to her first child, Archie, at the private Portland Hospital in Westminster. There's a very, very, very small minority of women in the UK who can afford giving birth in a private hospital. There's a dual thing there in recognizing labor, but also hiding the very particular, highly privileged ways in which her labor and comparing her to any woman. She's not any woman. Cut forward two months to the 10th of July, 2019. Megan arrived at a polo match carrying baby Archie and a series of photos of the pair quickly went viral. Almost immediately, she was shamed for holding the baby in the quote unquote wrong way as if she were about to drop him. Objectively, as a mother myself, looking at this photo, there was nothing, nothing to suggest. We have in our study kind of looked at a lot of the social media and it was quite shocking 
to see the cruel responses and the, the repetition of mother blaming and harsh judgments, um, comparing also Megan to a nanny, which is of course extremely racialized. A lot of black women are recounting the story of being confused to be the nanny. But also again, you know, speaking to the comparison of Kate, there was nothing of that kind ever. Shani is of course referring to Kate Middleton. Kate's motherhood has garnered a huge amount of media attention, but Shani points out that she's hardly ever criticised in the same way as Meghan. There's a more specific racialized and racist undertone that black women have historically been seen as irresponsible mothers, yeah, who don't know how to parent their children. And there's lots of writing from African-American feminist critics to black uh, British feminists about this. In the face of all of this ugly public scrutiny, Meghan made a very unroyal intervention. She spoke about her feelings. During an interview for an ITV documentary about the couple's royal tour of Africa, she was asked about the immense pressure she'd been under. Look, any woman, when they're, especially when they're pregnant, you're really vulnerable. And so that was made really challenging. And then when you have a newborn, and especially as a woman, it's really, it's a lot. So. You add this on top of just trying to be a new mom or trying to be a newlywed, it's, um, yeah, well, I guess, and also thank you for asking, because not many people have asked if I'm okay, but it's, uh, it's a very real thing to be going through behind the scenes. This was a really important moment that highlighted Megan's maternal vulnerability and the mental and emotional price of motherhood. She, she talks about it being behind the scene, being invisible. And perhaps unsurprisingly, it was very quickly endorsed by many people on Twitter, on social media, in mainstream media, who praised Meghan for her candidness and bravery. Lots of women just said, that's me. Nobody asked me how I am in this whole story. All the attention goes to the baby. And, and so in, in this way, there was something very, uh, authentic, fresh and significant in her candid kind of particularly centering of vulnerability. But at the same time, in this confession that Megan gave in the ITV documentary, she remains quite vague about what causes mothers to be vulnerable. She alludes to problems of mental health, but she says nothing about actually the huge work, labor that mothering entails. And she leaves the connection of what feminists have called the personal and the political completely untouched. She fails to link. Hi, I'm interrupting this episode of LSE IQ to let you know where you can find even more amazing LSE content. Our public lectures are free to attend and feature some of the most influential figures in the social sciences. To listen to past events, search LSE Lectures and Events wherever you get your podcasts and visit lse.ac.uk forward slash events to check out our upcoming programme. You're listening to LSE IQ. In this episode, we're asking, can mothers do it all? We've heard Megan publicly describe the pressures on her mental health and how some found her message relatable and refreshing. As Shani points out though, Megan didn't really highlight any specifics. What are the structural problems she's up against and what work really goes into mothering? When thinking about that last question, it's quite hard to forget about Meghan's immense wealth and privilege. In the Royal Couples Africa tour, what was very interestingly hidden is the nanny. At the beginning of their Africa tour, paparazzi photos of Meghan and Harry disembarking from the plane emerged. Behind the couple can be seen the blurred image of their nanny, who is usually hidden from view. There was no mention of the nanny. And that's again curious and interesting and important because it's, on the one hand, again, very typical of celebrities hiding that part, yeah? And what it does is, of course, it contributes to the myth that mothers do it all, and it completely obscures the very, very, um, large, often an expensive infrastructure that facilitates this wonderful balance. So here we see Megan perhaps struggling as she's confessing, but nevertheless, we don't have a sense of so much of the labor of mothering. 
definitely there could be good reasons why they wouldn't want to expose the nanny and to identify her. Um, so it's not to judge them, you know, but it's to suggest that there's an issue there in this consistent hiding. And then? Buckingham Palace has confirmed that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex will not be returning as working members of the royal family. The exit, at least at the time we wrote it, seemed to perhaps offer an opportunity for a slightly more radical, as it were, rewriting of what uh, black maternity is because it enabled this kind of perhaps um, release from the shackles of the very rigid and narrowly and tight expectations and definitions of what and what what a good mother in uh, the British royal family looks like, i.e., Kate Middleton. So Meghan's royal exit, in some ways, represents an escape from oppressive old-school ideas of motherhood. Of course, the media coverage of all of the events we've looked at was frenzied, complete royal mania. So what can looking at these representations of Meghan, both from the media and from herself, really tell us? She's an instance or an example of how more traditional and conservative notions of the good mother are being troubled and questioned. Um, the kind of dominance of white motherhood and invisibility of black motherhood is being challenged and questioned, I wouldn't say transform her representation, kind of remain in many ways quite circumscribed or limited by the things that they obscure. And these things that uh, Megan's representations obscure are the things and the aspects that are obscured more broadly in contemporary representations. So back to what we talked about birth and birthing, back to what we talked about childcare. Representations matter. The images and the narratives we see around us, the ideals of what does it mean to be a mother or a good mother, the more they are diverse, complex, not kind of perfect, honest, the more I think there is and there would be a space for allowing and giving women the, the kind of vocabulary and enabling um, not just women but parents more generally to articulate and the difficulties. I've always found the images and stories of women who do it all quite appealing, but it's hard to imagine how juggling everything would actually work. Shani and I talked more about the ways childcare stays hidden in the public arena. There was a very interesting article in the run-up to the last uh, US presidential election where lots of uh, politicians who were involved in earlier stages in the kind of uh, presidential elections were asked about their childcare arrangements and they all didn't want to comment. So there's something quite systematic about hiding uh, the childcare which supports this myth that parents do it all and particularly mother, good mothers do it all on their own. And we know that's not true, but these type of representations, including Megan's, really reinforce this very problematic uh, myth. Do you think that that also contributes to the fact that we might undervalue <coughs> that labour as a society? Absolutely, because it remains largely invisible, doesn't it? So we know it's often low paid, it's often called low skilled, but it's a highly skilled job, but it's often performed by migrant women, uh, women of color and poor women. And the fact that it's hidden serves its continuing invisibility and devaluation, absolutely, both economic devaluation, but also devaluation, uh, which is social devaluation. Over the past couple of years though, Issues of childcare have crept more into view. In the context of the pandemic, so many stories came out of precisely the kind of labor that mostly women have to carry out at home that remains invisible and that the workplace uh, very comfortably often ignores. The response to the coronavirus outbreak and, and, the, um, and the local level activities. That's all right. That's all right. We're, we know how it is working at home. Do you need to do anything? No, no, I'm good, thank you. Carry on, carry on. That's LSE's Dr Claire Wenham and her daughter in a viral 2020 BBC interview. So many similar videos have been shared over the past couple of years. And for those in office jobs, seeing kids on their parents' laps during Zoom meetings became normal. Oh, 
surprise, you know. This remains hidden. Why is that? Why is it that this part of people's lives has to remain completely outside the framework as if, you know, we're all pretending. It sounds like we might have to be a little bit patient for some of these broad social structural changes to take place. In the interim, I'm a millennial, I'm currently child free, but I might have children and I'm at the beginning of my career. And the myth of the woman who does it all is very seductive and sometimes it's very overwhelming and feels kind of impossible. So what kind of advice would you give to individuals to bear in mind? It's really interesting to me that you said that, that, that you feel that there's needs for patience because the, the conclusion of my book is entitled Impatience. <laughs> and that's my advice. Um, I think women have been told for too long to be patient and to wait because these things take time. And I'm not denying that these things t take time, but I think the, the notion that somehow you will have to wait now a decade or two until things improve, what it does is that it denies the fact that you have agency to perhaps not completely radically change things, but to definitely um, instigate and, and demand change. I'm very, very ambivalent and reluctant to give advice because part of what I'm so critical of is how women are constantly asked to do more work on themselves. Yeah. So any advice I'd give you would, would be do more of this. And I think women are constantly being exhorted to work on themselves, to improve themselves. My message is not to say, I'm not to blame, I have no responsibility. It's not this. It's to say when there's a problem, Let's see if there's a way to address the structural issue rather than to internalize it myself as an individual problem. The other advice is to reach out to other women because I think, at least from my own experience personally, but also from my research, um, lots of the women I interviewed experienced this alone, thinking that they are the only ones. And so I think, you know, solidarity um, is really based on sharing experience significantly not to leave it just a therapeutic space to share collective experiences into demands for structural changes we live in a moment that there's a lot of depressing things are happening but there is at least a noise about diversity and about inclusion i think a lot of it is performative box ticking superficial not genuine but the opportunity is there to come and say, well, this is on your agenda. This is what inclusivity would mean to me. That's my, you know, <laughs> very, very limited piece of wisdom with a very, very big caveat that I think women should stop internalizing the blame and resist this kind of constant barrage of messages that we should do more work on ourselves, that we should, you know, even if it's cast as positive, you know, it's always more work and more labor. It's five steps to becoming more resilient, six steps to becoming more, even to be kind with your, to yourself and don't be harsh on yourself. There's steps and there's, you know, there's work to be done. Um, and I think that's something that is exhausting, but is also reproducing inequality rather than improving it. This episode was produced by me, Natalie Abbott, with support from Sophie Mallet. If you'd like to find out more about the research in this episode, head to the show notes. And if you enjoy IQ, please leave us a review. Coming soon on LSE IQ. Everyone has a view on it and everyone thinks that it's going to fail. And, and that's really depressing. A lot of people that said that to me are mediocre people, so I don't need to care what they think. And I think I wish I'd, um, I wish I'd just been a lot more like, yeah, whatever. Next month on LSEIQ, Sue Winderbank will be asking, should you follow your passion? <laughs>